What I'll be talking to you about today is introducing lung damage uh, resulting from radiation toxicity and talking about the use of some natural products in mitigating this damage and modeling um, in mice, in a rodent model, uh, the adverse side effects of radiation therapy and then how one goes about to design, at least in, in the lab and hopefully for clinical use, radioprotecting agents. So the lung is one of the few organs in our body that it's directly exposed to the outside world. We breathe in all these toxins that harm the lung. But the lung also has 30% of all the vasculature of the body. And as such, it's a highly vascularized organ. So as such, everything that circulates in the blood inadvertently also affects the, the, the lung um, organ itself. So chemotherapeutics, toxins, bacterial toxins, everything that's in your blood will affect the lung. And last but not least, radiation, therapeutic radiation or even accidental radiation. And it's not a, lot, uh, a long time ago, just three, four years ago, that we had the accident in, of the Daiichi um, plant in, uh, in Japan. So um, therapeutic accidental radiation also could affect the lung. Now, the lung is a very radiosensitive tissue. So as such, um, it remains an obstacle to the treatment of a variety of cancers using, using radiotherapy. So an immediate effect of this tissue radiation is the generation of harmful reactive oxygen species. We call them ROS. ROS and RNS, reactive nitrogen species, are produced and oxidatively damage your macromolecules, your DNA, your lipids, your proteins. And this causes cell death. So nature is very wise. So our tissues have endogenous defenses so that we could detoxify such ROS and RNS when they form. This way we minimize the damage to the macromolecules. It's when you have an imbalance between the production of this ROS and RNS and their removal that you have oxidative stress. And this oxidative stress would ultimately lead to the pathogenesis of radiation-induced tissue damage. So radiation pneumonopathy. We know that radiation therapy is commonly used to treat cancers, thoracic malignancies in general and lung cancer in particular. And the thoracic malignancy, as you very well know, is also mesothelioma treatment. Up to 30% of lung cancer patients and 10 to 15% of other patients with thoracic malignancies, such as mesothelioma patients, will develop at some point during their treatment or after clinically significant radiation lung damage. And this damage is characterized by acute effects, pneumonia-like symptoms, which are mainly inflammatory symptoms, or fibrotic long-term effects that are mainly irreversible. So they've, they've generated a scale to describe these symptoms, a scale that's graded from zero to five, and it ranges from mild symptoms, a mild cough, to more severe um, pneumonia-like symptoms, severe cough, fibrosis, then also respiratory insufficiency, and much more serious complications in the lungs. In uh, mesothelioma patients themselves that are undergoing uh, radiotherapy, I found this review paper that describes three different studies um, with tw ranging from 24 to 86 patients where they reported anywhere between 12 and 16% of grade three and plus um, radiation pneumonopathy in this patient. 12 to 16% of radiation pneumonopathy. So it's, it's a real, it's, it's fact, it's, it's something that has to be dealt with. So I chose this graph to show that, let me see if my pointer works. Um, so this graph shows the volume of lung that's being uh, irradiated by at least 20 gray of radiation you can see in the dotted line how the incidence or the risk of generating uh, radiation pneumonopathy in your lung increases with the volume of the lung that's being irradiated. Now, this curve becomes much more steep if you superimpose onto radiation chemotherapy. So concurrent chemoradiation therapy increases dramatically the likelihood of getting 
radiation pneumonopathy. So, of at least grade two. So, patients receiving chemotherapy along with radiation increase their likelihood of getting side effects. So, you understand that the usefulness of radiotherapy is therefore limited by this toxicity of normal tissue damage. So, if you could protect the normal lung, the normal lung tissue from radiation injury, you could deliver much more effective radiation doses. So there's been active research in finding such radioprotecting agents that would um, prevent radiation pneumonopathy so you could have a much better tumoricidal radiation dose. People use in the clinic steroids to treat acute radiation symptoms, but this doesn't change your risk of developing late side effects such as, such as fibrotic complications. So there's an expanding preclinical evidence, a body of, of evidence that suggests that some botanicals may have the potential to impact a number of diseases, including cancer. So non-toxic natural agents could be useful along with, either alone or along with conventional therapies to prevent or even treat oxidative lung disease, lung damage, such as that that happens from radiation. Now, 60 million people in the U.S. use herbal remedies as part of their daily routine. And this prompted, in 1993, the NIH to form the NCAM, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. It's been recently renamed to National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Along with the ODS, these two agencies, the Office of Dietary Supplements, these two agencies promote research into the safety and efficacy of botanical agents. So under um, integrative health approaches, one includes natural products, mind-body practices, acupuncture, um, meditation, and other complementary health approaches. Now, out of the 10 most common complementary um, health approaches that are used by adults nowadays, the use of natural products is number one. So it's the most prevalent way that people use uh, complementary remedies for their disease or for their natural well-being. And the list is very long. This is by no means an inclusive list. This is just a small fraction of what one includes as natural products. And the bioactive ingredients in these natural products have been identified and the chemical structures have been, um, are known. And the way they work is also very complex. This is, I just show this not for you to identify any protein or any pathway, but this shows that any one of these bioactive ingredients in any one of these botanicals could act in a cell by modifying any one or more of these pathways that change the cell metabolism, the way a cell would behave. So it's a complicated story. So why, how does one choose which botanical would be useful for whatever indication? Well, the path is lengthy and very expensive. You start by identifying with epidemiological studies that a particular vegetable, fruit, botanical in general has some implication in your well-being, in the outcome of a disease state, for example. So then you purify the main bioactive ingredients, you test them in cells, you test them in mice, you test them in other animal models, you figure out the way they react, the mechanism that they act by, you figure out how bi their bioavailability, biospecificity, how well do they accumulate in the target organ, how well do they react in the target tissue, and then you test them in clinical trials before you can even imagine that you have an agent that is considered a drug and can be used in the clinic. So it's a lengthy path and a frustrating path, but also a very fulfilling path if you come up with something really useful for the patient. Um, my lab has been dealing with the use of uh, botanicals in the context of lung disease, acute chronic lung disease, and more recently, cancer. So we have worked on most of these botanicals that I show here, but over the past 10 years, we focused mostly on flaxseed. Flaxseed has been around for thousands of years. We didn't just discover flaxseed. It's been around since the times of the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Greeks. They were weaving linen out of the stem of this plant. They were weaving linen and ropes out of um, uh, the fibers that they can extract. But also, 
the medicinal properties of its uh, of its grains have been identified by ancient um, uh, medicine people. Uh, for example, the father of modern medicine, uh, Hippocrates, mentioned that uh, use of flaxseed could help abdominal pains. In the most recent times, in medieval France, medieval Europe, the French king Charlemagne even had rules and regulations forcing his constituents to use flaxseed for their well-being. And more recent, even um, Mahatma Gandhi mentioned flaxseed that um, would be good for one's health. So flaxseed is known, has been known for a long time. So what is so unique about flaxseed that makes it so uh, useful medicinally? Well, flaxseed is loaded with omega-3 fatty acids. In fact, it's ha it has the highest content of omega-3 fatty acids among all the plants. And it's even comparable to that of fish oil. Flaxseed also has this lignans, and most particularly the lignan SDG. It's a mouthful, seco isolarisi resinol diglucoside. And in order to secure NIH funding, I found out if you use that name instead of flaxseed, it helps you secure some grants. So I've been using that recently. Uh, my lab was able to secure, over the past 10 years, a good $6 million in NIH funding um, to study the usefulness of flaxseed for, for clinical usefulness. So the lignan SDG, uh, it, it it's, exists in flaxseed as a plant precursor, and it's acted upon by intestinal bacteria to be broken down to the enterolignans, enterodiol, and enterolactone, which have very potent antioxidant properties. So this is why we think flaxseed is, is useful and has potent um, medicinal properties in the different models that we tested it in. And when you compare this biphenolic SDG, this molecule, this main lignin in flax that has two phenol rings, it's very comparable to what you see, the biphenolic that you see in curcumin that from the spiced turmeric, in resveratrol from uh, red grapes, and in quercetin from red apples. So it's up there with the giants in botanical research. So this beautiful purple flower that has these wonderful grains has been tested by us and others in animal models of lung disease. And we've looked at uh, models of hyperoxic, high oxygen level induced damage for people that are getting um, um, oxygen therapy, for ischemia reperfusion lung damage that's relevant to transplantation damage, um, acid aspiration for aspiration pneumonia, but also in mouse models of asbestos-induced mesothelioma and tobacco carcinogen-induced lung cancer. What I'll be talking to you today is about our mouse model of thoracic radiation and how that um, causes um, pneumonia, pneumonopathy. Now, when you take the lignan SDG and you incubate cells, lung cells, normal lung cells with it, and then you act upon them radiation, you irradiate these cells. If you have a fluorescent dye in the medium that's taken up by these cells, it will fluoresce if there's oxidative stress that's being caused by radiation. And sure enough, when you give two gray of I apologize for that. If you give two gray of radiation and it's right up in this panel, you see how these cells light up as a Christmas tree. If you have SDG, even in micromole concentrations, in the medium, you see how in a dose-dependent way, you decrease down to almost nothing the reactive oxygen species. So this tells us that SCG is a very potent free radical scavenger, so it removes harmful oxidants. Now when we fed, so how about in an intact animal? These were cells. What about in an intact animal? Well, if you feed a flaxseed-rich diet to mice, and then you look at their lungs, so you give it in the diet, but then you look at their lungs, the target organ, and you do microarray analysis to look at all the entire mouse genome. We looked at 30,000 genes. You can see how you, the, the fact that they are eating a flaxseed diet separates the mice based on the expression of their genes in two different categories. Control diet fed mice and flaxseed diet fed mice. They're very clearly separated by this principal component analysis. When you look at their genes, whether a, a gene lights up or not, is upregulated or downregulated, it's clearly defined by the diet. So there's a signature of this diet in the lung itself. Now, when we looked closely at specific gene groups to see, well, what kind of genes are upregulated or downregulated based on the fact that you're just eating flaxseed, we looked at 
several categories of genes, and red is upregulation and green is downregulation, so they're decreased in their expression. We looked at, apologize again, we looked at this particular group over here, and what this group signifies are antioxidant protective genes. We're upregulating the expression in the lung of protective genes. So we thought that since the lignans in flaxseed are free radical scavengers, and since the flaxseed itself can boost antioxidant tissue defenses in the lung, that this grain as a diet would likely benefit a mouse that's being exposed to thoracic radiation. So we have a mouse model of how we do things. And we were fortunate to have the SARP at Penn. This is a half a million dollar irradiator machine. It's called the Small Animal Radiation Research Platform, which works pretty much as the irradiator for patients. We have this um, uh, beam that's being directed to, this is not working. Oh, it, the mouse is being placed here, just like a patient would be. And this arm rotates around the mouse and delivers very precise radiation. This is also um, e equipped with micro CT, so you could really see um, right through the lung. So this is how our mice are being placed in the, uh, in the beam, and we expose just the thorax, you can see here. And when you do that, what results is this white striation here around the thorax. The melanin granules in the hair pop, and the hair turns white. So it tells us that we have irradiated the right area in the mouse. The mice are anesthetized when they're given the radiation, and the radiation doesn't hurt. They don't feel anything when they are undergoing this procedure. And then they soon wake up and they run around in the cage. But we have, we know that we delivered this dose. We see the striation. And then several months later, now the mice are being placed on a controlled diet or a flaxseed supplemented diet. And four months later, we look at their lungs to see, well, have we changed anything? We know that when you radiate the lungs, you have... And XRT refers to X-ray treatment, so it's radiation treatment. When you irradiate the lungs, and they are, these are from mice that have been given a controlled diet, you have a high level of inflammatory cells infiltrating the lung. These are alveolar neutrophils, and these are alveolar macrophages. They're all immune cells that are rushing to the area because there's damage. So there's high level of inflammation in these lungs, but not in the mice that have been given flaxseed, that are kept on a flaxseed diet. Al alveolar neutrophils, alveolar macrophages are decreasing their numbers. So we're decreasing inflammation just based on the fact that they're feeding on a diet, on a, on a grain. The most severe effect of radiation is fibrosis. This is irreversible. Once it starts, the lungs become stiff. They're unable to effectively oxygenate your blood. And we have here um, at the top panel, the left is a low magnification, the right is a high magnification of the same lung. Blue shows the extent of collagen that's being deposited in this lung. This is how the lung becomes fibrotic and unable to support normal breathing and normal oxygenation. At the bottom are lungs from a flaxseed-fed mouse. You can see how the architecture is being intact, how it's being well-preserved, and there's very little blue, very little collagen that's being deposited. Of course, anyone could choose their best slide and their best lung and make a point. So we didn't want to do that. We have three different ways of quantifying the extent of fibrosis in these lungs. So what we did, we took sections in, from each lung, multiple sections, of this lung, histological sections, and we stained them for collagen, as we did at the top panel for blue, with trichrome blue staining, and we gave them blindly to a pathologist to score. The pathologist came up with a scale of one to four, four being the most severe extent of fibrosis, and sure enough, the uh, irradiated lungs have had a very high fibrotic score from mice that were fed a controlled diet. But if the mice were fed flaxseed, there was far less of a fibrotic score in these sections. We also took the lungs and we acid hydrolyzed the collagen out of these lungs and we quantified it with a spectrophotometric assay, an enzymatic assay. And sure enough, similar to what we saw histologically, you had far less collagen, the amount of collagen deposited in these lungs. So, Flaxseed has antifibrotic effects in the irradiated lung. But radiation oncologists are very skeptical beings. The, our collaborating radiation oncologists told us, 
well, if you are going to convince me that this thing works, it has to, to protect the normal tissue but not protect the tumor from radiation killing. So you should not defeat the purpose while you're giving the radiation. So what we did, we injected intravenously uh, into these mice a, a cancer cell line, a, a metastatic cancer that went into the lungs. The, the cancer cells lodged there and they formed cancer nodules. And when we did that, we did that in mice that were feeding flaxseed or a control, isocaloric control diet. And we irradiated the tumor to see whether or not the tumor was protected by the diet. So, and the results are at the bottom panel. So this is how the tumor looked like, here in the middle panels, um, when we gave the radiation. And this is how they looked like two weeks later. And we quantified using tumor morphometry on histological um, sections. We use tumor morphometry software to quantify the extent of the area that's occupied by tumor in this mice, and sure enough, we found that we had a very, like 20% of the area of the lung was occupied by tumor uh, in both groups. But when you gave um, radiation to a control mouse or to a flaxseed-fed mouse, you equally, if not even a little better, you equally decreased, you shrunk the tumor equally well. So the diet did not uh, inhibit the radiation from shrinking the tumor. So that was a very valuable finding. So um, I didn't show you that, but mouse survival is also improved by 30, 35%. If mice were placed on flaxseed, we were able to prevent radiation-induced oxidative lung damage, and we showed that with measuring different oxidative parameters in the lung parenchyma itself. Uh, inflammation, fibrosis, and, and cytokine, inflammatory cytokine secretion. We looked at it at the gene level and at the secretory level, and we decreased inflammation overall in these lungs. And most importantly, we did not protect tumor from radiation killing. So we published our findings that dietary flaxseed would prevent radiation-induced oxidative lung damage and inflammation and fibrosis in a mouse model. But importantly, we also showed the very same results that I showed you now in mice that were given flaxseed weeks after radiation exposure. We gave, we started these mice on flaxseed two, four, and six weeks after they were irradiated, that they had completed the radiation therapy. So if you're skeptical, and that's a far, a big leap to make, but if you're skeptical for taking anything during the radiotherapy treatment, then starting it at some point later would also have a beneficial effect. We're hoping to show that in clinical trials. Now, talking about clinical trials, flaxseed supplementation is currently being used in many clinical trials across the country. And you can see at the top, uh, they're being used in cancer trials, in breast cancer, colon cancer, ovarian, and prostate cancer, but also in conditions such as diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension. At Penn, which are the four, two, the four purple panels, we have already conducted um, a cystic fibrosis a study, we just finished it, and a lung transplantation study where patients were placed for a month, a month and a half on a flaxseed diet. And it was just pilot studies. We just wanted to see if in these particular patient populations, we were able to measure some biomarkers. And we were able to measure, they would tolerate flaxseed, and we could measure some of the flaxseed metabolites in their um, bloodstream. And we um, are very close to obtaining um, funding for a clinical trial in radiation um, and uh, radi uh, radiation lung cancer patients, radiotherapy lung cancer patients. And hopefully in the near future, we will also have um, a study with smokers, cigarette smokers. So um, in our, the study that we just concluded in uh, uh, cystic fibrosis patients, we gave them these packets of flaxseed. It's two tablespoons of flaxseed a day. It's finely ground, uh, vacuum-packed, um, sealed uh, flaxseed. And we asked the patients to take them in the course of a day, sprinkle some in the morning on your cereal, a little bit for lunch on your salad, take it as a milkshake in the afternoon. So just consume it in the course of a day. And then we measured uh, at different times on this trial, we measured um, um, enterolignan levels in their bloodstream, and we confirmed that we could measure um, 
levels that we consider to be therapeutic in these uh, in these patients. So in the future, we hope to have a, a bigger study. This was just 10 patients. We hope to have a study where we could look at the fact um, of whether flax seed supplementation would decrease systemic inflammation and disease exacerbations that takes these cystic fibrosis patients back and forth to the hospital. So hold this thought for a moment. Flax seed decreasing systemic inflammation. How does that relate to mesothelioma? I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I have to because this is a mesothelioma conference. Since I was invited to come and talk about the radiation part of my studies, we were awarded at Penn a big grant to study asbestos remediation. So I'll, I'll talk to you in a second about that. So the working um, paradigm of mesothelioma carcinogenesis is that asbestos induces a chronic inflammatory state. This ultimately leads to mutagenesis and to tumor formation, especially if you have a genetic predisposition. We've heard about that today. So we hypothesize that if you could inhibit the systemic chronic inflammation and this reactive oxygen species in mice, in our case, that have been exposed to asbestos, you could prevent the ultimate formation of mesothelioma. And we wanted to test this using our flaxseed and our flaxseed lignin. So we started, uh, so, and this is where I wanted to mention about the recent grant that Penn received as part of the Superfund Research Program of the National, um, of the NIHS, and Environmental Health Science Institute of the NIH. So there's a site at, in Ambler, Pennsylvania, where um, the EPA in 2009, it declared as a Superfund site because asbestos was being deposited there. Asbestos containing material were being deposited over the course of 60 years because there was a nearby plant that was making asbestos containing products. So they covered, this, covered it up with soil which has long been eroded and has been washed off into the nearby Wissahigon Creek. And you can see this 11 acre property up here, it's sitting in the middle of a residential area. So people are exposed. And I just met um, a woman outside who came to the conference whose husband died from mesothelioma and is from Ambler. So uh, the EPA, together with NHS, have formed this um, Superfund um, uh, research program or are supporting this Superfund research program to find ways to remediate asbestos and look into ways to mitigate these adverse health effects. So this $10 million grant has six components in, that includes soil engineers, botanists that are looking at fungi that could degrade the asbestos fiber and make it less tumorigenic. It's really a fascinating group of, of people that got together. Um, we have project number five. By we, I mean my lab and that of Dr. Stephen Albeldas. Um, we're looking at the chemopreventive aspect of, of uh, flaxseed and how it could decrease the likelihood of getting the disease. So could flaxseed prevent this by, by decreasing this chronic inflammatory state, prevent the likelihood of developing mesothelioma in exposed individuals. And this is a cross-section of a lung that shows how these flaxseed fibers really, really spear right through the tissue, and the cells cannot really um, get rid of it. They are just constantly being damaged. So asbestos fiber, my, my pointer is not working, but I have a backup pointer. There you go. So the asbestos fiber penetrates right through the cell membrane, causes reactive oxygen species, activates the entire cellular machinery of the cell to start secreting um, inflammatory cytokines, recruiting more cells to the area, and causing a more exacerbated, exacerbated inflammatory state. So if you could blunt that, then hopefully you could stop this vicious circle. So we exposed macrophages to asbestos, and you can see this is a true picture from my lab, from a cell that's being speared right through the middle by an asbestos fiber. And these cells are phagocytic cells. They try to engulf the asbestos fiber, and they can't. And they're being, uh, constantly being damaged, and they start secreting all kinds of things. They start secreting uh, reactive oxygen species, inflammatory cytokines, IL-1, TNF. These are all cytokines that are substances that recruit more cells to the area. So. When we did that, we, we, I'm sorry, let me go back. 
So we added SDG to these cells several hours after they've been exposed to an asbestos fiber. And then we looked at 24 hours to see, well, what have they secreted? Have we decreased the harmful agents that they're secreting? Sure enough, oxidative stress that's being generated in these cells, it's being mitigated by the presence of SDG, this flaxseed lignin SDG. What about inflammatory cytokines? IL-1 beta, it's the most prevalent pre-inflammatory cytokine. The, the level of IL-1 beta in the supernatant of these cells has been decreased significantly by the presence of SDG. And these are the very first preliminary studies that we did. So in summary, we're blocking asbestos-induced ROS generation by these macrophages. Uh, we're blocking cytokine secretion, and we also blocked um, lipid peroxidation, so oxidative damage to these cells. So we're hoping using genetically modified mice that carry the very same mutations that patients have that make them more susceptible when they're exposed to asbestos to get mesothelioma. We're using these same mouse models that model the clinical manifestation of the disease to place them on a flaxseed diet and see whether or not downstream they will develop tumors or flaxseed would decrease the likelihood that they develop tumors. And I would like to end it here and by saying that we're really hoping that um, our studies, if they do show efficacy with uh, the long-term goals of this uh, project, that they would, they could, we could start um, dreaming of a clinical trial where we place exposed individuals um, onto such a diet to see whether or not some biomarkers of chronic inflammatory um, damage will be uh, decreased or modified by the act of the diet. And let me stop here and just thank um, the founders of our, um, the, the, the agencies that have funded our studies over the years, um, including the NCI, NHS, and NIAID. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. I'd be happy to answer questions. Otherwise, I, I will be outside in a little bit. Yeah. So um, when we're looking at dietary flaxseed, um, do we have to, uh, should they be fresh or do we have to look for dates? How do we know we're buying active ingredients? Because there's been so many problems lately about supplements sure. not really containing the sure. active ingredient. That's an excellent question. It goes to the heart of the problem of a lot of botanical research that's been happening. Um, flaxseed has to be used fresh because it gets oxidized very easily and it loses its, its um, I would say, its medicinal or its helpful properties. Um, you should not take it intact. You should grind it. If you take it intact, it comes right out. So you have to finely grind it. You have to grind it freshly every day. That's the only way you're going to keep it um, as in the best quality as possible to use it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh